Hello, I'm Robert Lomas, and this is the 15th of 17 episodes of a work called Ten Nights in the Black Lion, which was written by the novelist Daniel Owen in 1859. It was originally written as a serial in a magazine called Charles Abala, which had been produced by his friend Nathaniel Jones, but was now edited by John Davis. This 15th episode was published on November the 17th, 1859. Episode 15 The Eighth Evening The following month my business took me to America, to Washington, just before the time of the re-election of Congress. Judge Lyman's connection with the case of Green and Young Hammond in Cedarville had destroyed his character and reduced his standing with all the states and their representatives, and his party had insisted that he stand down from the election. He claimed this was to allow him to defend his actions, but it was well known that he had offered strong opposition to the Temperance Party and had prevented any prohibition laws being put before the Senate. In the light of the murder of Willie Hammond, there had been a cooling of support for Judge Lyman back in Washington. I was sitting in the Fuller Hotel at noon, the day after I had arrived in Washington. I noticed a strangely familiar figure, looking around as if he were searching for someone. While I was puzzling who it might be, I overheard a man beside me discussing him. That's the problem. The strong parties often put unsuitable members in the house, the man said. Who? said another. That guy over there, Judge Lyman, came the answer. Oh, said the other. He doesn't matter. He has nothing to the insight of that august body. But his vote is worth something, at least if there are important questions on the table. But what price does he ask for his vote? The man lifted his shoulders and his eyebrows, but said nothing. I'm serious, said the questioner. Didn't you just imply that Lyman will sell his vote for the highest price? That depends entirely on who offers. If they have something to lose as well as to win, then most members won't go against their party to serve outside interests. The judges befriended many individuals who are called lobby members, and is often seen in their company. No doubt he's here in this hotel rather than in the house to meet such gentlemen. They pay well for votes. Surely this can't be what we expect of a legislator in the broadest sense. There must be a better way than this. Yes, in the broadest sense. This man has fallen into deep moral humiliation. He isn't honouring the electorate or his country. His presence here in Washington doesn't speak highly of the party or the people he represents. No, yet as things are now, we cannot judge the moral value of the voting public from the type of man they send to the Senate. Delegates only demonstrate the strength of their parties. Lyman has sold out his country, just like Benedict Arnold once did. Why? They both sold out, if the proposal offered paid out highly enough. You say he gambles? Yes, it's his vocation to gamble. Of that I'm sure. Few nights pass without him visiting the gaming table. I didn't hear any more, but I wasn't surprised by what I'd overheard. My previous knowledge of the man had prepared me to believe all that had been said. During the week I was staying in Washington, I had the chance to see Judge Lyman both in and out of the house, and he only went there when there was some important measure to be put to the vote that would confer privileges on someone. Many times I saw him so drunk that he would stagger when trying to walk through the lobby, and often he went back to sleep in his seat, and worse, he would be found dozing when his name was called out to vote. He sometimes had to be shaken several times before he was awake enough to cast his vote. Fortunately, this was to be his last foray into Washington. The following election, a better man than he took his place. Some two years later, I found myself approaching the quiet village of Cedarville again. As the church spire came into sight, and I saw the rows of houses with leafy woods and green fields at their back, all the exciting events that took place at the time of my previous visits came back into my mind. I was still haunted by the memory of the deaths of Hammond and his devastated mother, who departed this life together. But oh, how the time had changed. 
Neglect and ruin were visible on every hand. Hedges were badly maintained and knocked down here and there. What had once been beautiful grass avenues were overgrown with weeds, and gardens formerly as rich as rainbows of roses were now deserts. Passing Judge Hammond's house, I saw the chimney broken, its bricks lying where they had struck the floor, and the old roof almost falling in. The windows were closed, but the door was open, and as the carriage passed, I saw an old man sitting inside. He wasn't close enough to the door for me to see his face, but I recognised his long white hair. I had no doubt it was Judge Hammond. I arrived at the old Black Lion, and time here had also had a big impact. By the porch of the house were two or three old whisky casks. On one sat a grimy, filthy old man. He had his back against the wall, and his eyes followed my every step as I approached the house. "'Ah, there you are,' he said. As I came closer to him, he spoke sloppily and stood up stiffly, but I just recognised him as Simon Slade. Looking more closely, I saw that the eye that I had thought to be closed was ruptured. How quickly my imagination jumped back to relive the scenes I saw that night in the bar when he had received that injury. How the barbarian mob, which he had fueled with liquor, had fallen on Harvey Green and nearly killed him, along with Slade, when I told them where he was hiding. "'It's good to see you, boys. It's good to see you,' Simon Slade said. "'Yes, I'm still not right, as you see. But how are you? How are you?' He shook my hand with a sort of halting, drunken tenderness. I felt uncomfortable in his presence. How pitiable the man was. He was sliding down into that pit he had dug for others. He no longer had the strength to resist his fate. I tried to talk to him for a few minutes, but his mind was clouded and his answers wild and disconnected. I left him and went into the bar. Can I stay here for two days? I asked the sluggish and inattentive creature that sat in the chair behind the desk. Yes, I think so, he said, remaining seated. I want a room, please, I repeated walking towards him. The man got up slowly and placed his hand in an old desk. Eventually he pulled out a smelly-looking guest book and threw it on the counter. Write your name in there, he said, without offering me a pen. After searching in vain round the room for pen and ink, I took my own pencil out of my pocket and wrote my name on the greasy old page of the book. As I finished, Frank came in with a cigar in his mouth and a thick cloud of smoke encircling his head. He'd grown into a big, strong man since I saw him last, but I could detect little humanity in his face. "'How are you?' he said, and offered me his hand. "'Peter,' he said, "'tell Jane to put room number eleven in order for the gentleman without delay, and take care to tell her to change the sheets.' "'Things look a bit chaotic here,' I said. "'Yes,' he said, "'but it always was a rather disorganised place.' "'How's your mother?' I asked. "'No better,' he replied, and a troubled look passed over his face. "'Your mother is sick, is she?' "'Yes, and has been for quite some time,' Frank said. "'Is she at home?' I asked. "'No, sir. He was reluctant to say any more on that matter. "'So I didn't question him further. He took his chance to leave me. "'The Black Lion bar room had the same old furniture as before, "'but it was now far more shabby. "'Everything seemed out of place.' and a general air of disturbing disorder overwhelmed the room. The floor was dirty and smelt unpleasant. I decided to go into the sitting room, but the smell there wasn't much better. I could write my name in the filth encrusting the tables. In search of purer air, I headed out to the porch. Slade was still there, sitting with his back against the wall. It's a nice day, I said. Wonderful, he said with an air of resignation. "'You don't seem to be doing as well as you were a while back,' I said. "'No, uh, you see, there is it. "'It's these old teetotals that are decimating everything,' he mumbled. "'Is that so?' I said. "'Well, yes, you can see, Cedarville isn't the same as when you first came to the Black Lion. "'It's not been for a long time. "'There is, there is, what's it called? "'The curse of the old teetotals is here. "'They've messed about with... Everything. I guess 
he began and then stopped. He was muddling up his words in such a way I couldn't make much sense of what he was saying, so I set off into the town to attend to my business. I felt a heartfelt compassion for the pitiful object he had become. During the afternoon I discovered that Mrs. Slade had been committed to the asylum. The terrible events of the day on which young Hammond was killed had devastated her. She'd never been happy since her husband had decided to leave the peaceful occupation of Miller to keep a public house. When the news reached her ears that Willie and his mother were both dead, she gave a shriek and fell into a faint. But her friends had long before noticed that she seemed to be losing her senses. Frank had been her ultimate idol. He'd been an affectionate boy and very loving before they moved to the pub. But I wasn't surprised to learn that he'd become estranged from her. Such a place as a black lion was enough to corrupt an angel. Soon her worst fears for her son were realised. The nature of the human heart is to indulge all evil, and Frank was encouraged in this by the wicked and corrupt individuals he met every day in that bar room. If his father had deliberately set out to create a plan to destroy him, he couldn't have done much better. I heard that Flora had tried to appeal to Frank during their mother's troubled decline. Flora was fond of young Willie Hammond, and his appalling end almost robbed her of her reason too. She never viewed her home in the same way after that dreadful incident. She and her mother no longer had any influence over her brother. Despite his mother's tears and the gentle tenderness of his sister, Frank went down and down as he pursued his dreadful career. Her father's behaviour also caused Flora great distress. He'd been cheerful and tender, and as kind to his daughter as any father in the whole county. But now all he did was sit mumbling nonsense in the porch of the pub. That evening I was once again back in the bar of the Black Lion. Old Slade was a bit more alert by now, having poured some strong beer down his throat after dinner. There were two or three rough-spoken persons drinking, but Frank was using the most deplorable language of any of them. My attention was drawn to a young man called Ned, who, by the looks of him, I thought was the son of a Mr. Hargrove, who I had previously met in the bar of the Black Lion. After some lowly and scandalous talk about this, that and the other, Simon Slade spoke about the way that old Hargrove came to fetch Ned every night, as if he weren't able to take care of himself. If Ned were in the twentieth layer of hell, his father would be sure to find him, said Slade. I hate seeing his stupid old face and hearing his delusional fantasies as he comes to fetch him. Send him home with a flea in his ear, Ned, said one fellow. That's just what I'll do next time, said Ned. Oh, yes, but that's what you've promised to do many times before. Well, now's your chance. Jump to it, Ned, the fellow said, as a respectable old man of private appearance, who I had formerly met by the name of Mr. Hargreave, came into the bar. Edward, Edward, come home, my son, he said. Don't go, his bar companion said with one voice. But Ned didn't look as if he wanted to defy Mr. Hargrove to his face. I watched Ned, who sat completely still. He was clearly upset. Edward, said the gentle father once again. He spoke with an irresistible strength, but was not over-authoritative. As Ned started to get up, Frank Slade shouted at the old man, Leave him alone, you're a sick old fool. Mr. Hargrove stared boldly back at Frank, but said nothing. Now look here, said Simon Slade, sounding indignant. I'm tired of this every night. Why don't you keep Ned at home? Nobody wants you or him here. Don't sell liquor to him then, said Mr. Hargrove. Selling liquor is my job, said Slade indignantly. It's a pity you don't have a more honourable vocation, said Mr. Hargrove in a sad tone. If you insult my father, said Frank, bawling his fists and waving them towards the old man's head, I'll, 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 I'll. It would have been better not to have torn down the dreadful old cottages that used to be here than build this place, said Mr. Hargrove. Frank rushed forward as if to grab him by the throat, but a well-built, strong man stood in his way. I recognised him as being called Mr. Lion. Well, young man, it won't go well with you if you touch so much as a hair on his head, Lion said. 
Thank you for standing up for an old man, said Mr. Hargrove quietly. But knowing that a place like this is bad for you, why do you still come here? Yes, this is a bad place, Lyon said. But custom and habit, Mr. Hargrove, is the curse that brings me here. Let's get an anti-drink law passed, and then we'll have a chance to change things. Then why don't you vote with the teetotalers to pass such a law, said Hargrove. Why, I would vote for such a law, if you should ask me. I thought you'd vote against us, said Hargrove. I don't vote against you. I'm not as blind to my own well-being as that. And if you knew the truth, I think there isn't a man in this room tonight, except for Slade and his son, who wouldn't vote on the same side as you, sir. It's very peculiar, then, said Mr. Hargrove. With all these men on our side, our candidate lost the vote at the last election. You must blame the moderates for that. They can see no danger, and always vote with their old party. Come outside, Mr. Lyon. I wish to speak to you, Hargrove said. Mr. Lyon got up and left with Mr. Hargrove and his son. As they were leaving the room, Frank stood up. You're a cursed hypocrite, he called after Lyon. But his father, acting a bit smarter this time, tried to silence him. A head-on quarrel quickly developed between the two. I couldn't bear to stay any longer to listen to the swearing and cursing as they argued. It was the most tragic demonstration of the degradation of human nature that I had ever seen. I left the bar and went to my room, glad that I could escape the polluted atmosphere and the horror of these appalling scenes. That's the end of the fifteenth episode of Ten Nights in the Black Lion, written by Daniel Owen. It was first published in the magazine Charles Abella on November the 17th, 1859. And this episode reverted to the previous custom of not being signed. I'm Robert Lomas, and I spent the last year translating this. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please click the subscribe box in the bottom right hand corner of the screen.